Hello everybody, it's Gary Stuckey with Real Music. Hope you're doing okay wherever you are today. Got a great show coming right at you right now with two guests today. J.D. Andrew and Billy Bob Thornton. Yes, that Billy Bob Thornton. <laughs> they're here. They are the Box Masters and they're here talking about a brand new album coming out on August the 30th called Love and Hate in Desperate Places. And we discuss that album and break it down we talk about music and their careers and everything in between. A lot of things uh, that you will learn. You might need to get a notepad and, you know, jot stuff down. You might learn a few things. Just saying, you know, just an idea. Uh, but great uh, conversations with these guys. Very talented guys. The new music sounds great. I think you're going to enjoy it. So here we go. Here they are. The Box Masters. Hey, Gary. Hello, hello. Gary. What's up? Not much, man. How you doing? Doing good. Yeah, uh, interviews go over sometimes. It's all good with me because I could talk forever. Y'all got four <laughs> hours? <laughs> yeah. Well, we get worked up and we uh, we tend to yeah. go long. So Yeah, we had a, our first interview of the day. He was a kind of a long-winded guy, so it kind of put uh, us behind. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say anything about that. No, I, I try. I, I get the hint, though. You know, somebody says, hey, uh, you know, I got to get out of here, you know. I gotta get a, you know, I gotta get get on a bus or something. Right. Uh, so what's happening? What's new? Well, just to, you know, hanging out here. Uh, we've been working in the studio a lot, and uh, we start the tour. Uh, we start rehearsals on the twenty fifth of August, and okay. our first cool. show on the third of September in Houston, and uh, we're out through November fourth, uh, and it's a pretty packed schedule it's uh it, it's a lot of stuff i think 55 shows in 61 days or something like that it's, yeah, it's insane it's I, I was intense. i actually talked to herb alpert's a friend of ours you know herb is yeah, cool. you know, and uh he's just a great dude and he and i were talking yesterday just to catch up and i had sent him our tour schedule and he called me and the first thing he said before i even said hello he goes are you insane? I said, well, he goes, I just looked at your tour schedule. He goes, how are you going to do this? I said, we do it every year. You know, and he goes, well, I, I, I said, well, look, you're 89. You're still touring. He goes, yeah, but not like that. He goes, I do take a little time off, you know? Right. You must really love to do it. Right. That's, it's gotta be what it is. Right. Well, also, we just don't, we'd rather play than, than, than have days off. I mean, the days off are just kind of, you lay around the bus and you watch golf or something on the, you know, and yeah. you, you know, you eat too much and then you. Also, the bus company <laughs> still charges us and, you know, we still have to pay all the guys in the band and the crew yeah. on the days off. So, you know, yeah. yeah, I think, but everybody would rather be playing than, mm. you know, going to the next Applebee's. I mean, we, we love an Applebee's, we love a Chili's, but at the same time, I'd rather go play a show than just hang out at Applebee's. Yeah, I understand. Totally understand. And I'm sure the fans would agree. You know, they, yeah. they want to hear you. They would rather hear you than go to Applebee's. Um, well, tell me, there's a, you got a brand new single called A River Rising, which mm -hmm. I really do like. And it reminds me, it's got a retro sound. I'm trying to pinpoint the sound. You know, not that you were trying to sound like somebody else, but uh, there's a different, uh, there's a bunch of different sounds in there, which I, I'm hearing like uh, some Tom Petty or something, and maybe some classic uh, rock bands in there. What what was your idea behind the song, and how did you come up with that song exactly? Well, the song is about how uh, it's almost like, you know, somebody trying to warn people to not sleep on things. It's like, uh, it's like, dude, there's a, I'm telling you, there's a lion in the neighborhood, you know? And they're like, Oh yeah, yeah. I heard something, but there was one around here. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. There's a lion in the neighborhood, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so the song is really, I mean, it's slightly political, you know, but it's about how, you know, people have all these strong opinions about everything and they all love to talk to each other about stuff and say, hey, uh, you know, I think this, and I like this guy, and I don't like this woman, and I don't like this guy, and, you know, whatever. 
and I think we should do this or whatever. But nobody ever really does much. They just kind of, you know, carry on with their day and, you know, watch Bonanza and have a steak and do whatever they do. Right. And, uh, so this is about how our society is kind of crumbling in a lot of ways. And uh, and that uh, it's like, no, this is you don't understand. This is an emergency here. We need to wake right. up, you know, a little bit. And so it's like there's a river rising uh, uh but uh it's like this thing it may be rising slowly and but it's sneaking up on you and uh so that's really what the song's about it's about a warning that you can't sit on your your butt all the time you know you, yeah. you have to actually talk to other people about you know what's going on in life you know and uh and it's not just it's not just political it's it's about anything it's about your family it's about your community and it's about everything you know it's it's everything to do with you know let's all come together here and figure things out you know and and, and at least be awake and, and not, right. awake. not awake. <laughs> there's a difference very, very, um very big difference yeah what do you think though you know as a society you know and people don't have to get political and say i like this person i like this person but as a society like you said, why not come together and just talk about things and make a point to discuss things instead of point fingers? Like you said, there's a lot of talking, not walking. No. But don't you think that music is a big key to bringing people together for that idea instead of point fingers? Doesn't music kind of like this song kind of brings you together and people listen to it go, maybe there is a flood coming. Maybe I don't need to be pointing the finger as the flood sweeps me away right sure no I, absolutely. right no, that's you're, you're absolutely right it, it's a it's just, and, and it's about you know not not only politics but you know social issues and just you know medicine corporations you know all, it's yeah. about everything it's like we're not really paying attention much to what's happening in the world here even though there's a lot of yammering about it in the press you know it's like you know, the news is not a great place to get the news. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and so uh, it's uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, this is not new. You know, I mean, this yeah. it's been going on, you know, since I was born. It's just that I think things are getting a little more apparent, uh, you know, that, you know, because we were. I think we were sheltered from a lot of things when we were growing up. And plus when you're a kid, you know, as long as you can play in the backyard and everything's good with you and your buddies, you know, and you got a new bicycle, you don't really care. So, you know, I didn't pay right. much attention when I was a kid, but yeah. You know, right. That, that song is that. And then, and then we, our first one we put out, uh, the first single from this album that comes out August 30th uh, was called Jane Mansfield's car based on real life events. And uh, so that's a that's an interesting one too. And then we have one more single coming out before the record does. And well, it comes out on the day the record is on released. the day the record was released. Yes, and the it, record is called "Love and Hate in Desperate Places," and it is available August thirtieth. <laughs> J- J- Won't be long. This man, I, I, yeah, I, I always I'm the guy who that. runs the website and the merch. Uh, yeah, so, so I know, you know nothing about. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, he knows what day the tour starts and the rehearsal starts. <laughs> And he knows kind of what day the record comes yeah. out, but that helps. Me, me putting a stack of them in front of him saying, sign this stuff, <laughs> sign this so we can sell it on the website, you know? So that's right. You gotta uh, have some idea, you know? So, uh, so what you're saying is you two help each other out. You're, you're good for one another is what you're saying. Right? Max Pratt and his wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Both eat no fat. Yeah. So there you go. Very uh, good. I like, I like that. But, but yeah, it's, um, we have a good partnership and that's why we, you know, that's why we're going on our 18th year and 17th release. Cause, uh, wow. that's awesome. I do all stuff that Billy doesn't want to do. And, uh, and I'm also too cheap to hire somebody to do it. So, <laughs> so it's like, okay, I can relate. Uh, yeah. so we just have, so- to, you know, we just have us and our families and that kind of runs the operation other than, right get on the road and we have three guys on the road with us and in the band and then some crew guys and uh 
you know, we just go out and do it as intensely as we can in the window of time that we have. And then we uh, sure. recover for a little while after we get home. Right. You got to do that too. Um, well, you you have to have a certain chemistry. I mean, you're around each other all the time. There's got to be something musically there and not just friendship wise. You know, how did y'all discover that chemistry whenever y'all met and when y'all got together to play music how do you decide you know it's i guess it's one thing to go he, he's my friend i like to jam with him but if it really works when you come yeah. together right hey we, let's jam together you know it was billy came to the studio one day hmm. we'd been working together for a couple of weeks on one of his solo records uh it was his fourth solo record called beautiful door and he came down the studio one day and said hey um, I just asked, got asked to record a cover of a Hank Williams song, Lost Highway, for a Canadian TV show. I've seen you plunking around on the guitar a little bit. How about you learn this song and we'll record it tonight? So I learned the song. It's like I've, you know, played a little guitar, but I wasn't a serious musician type. I was, you know, I had worked really hard to be a recording engineer and, you know, learn what I could and. Yeah, so when he asked me, it's like, oh, okay. But so we recorded it, and, uh, you know, I remember that night, you know, it's like we started off with acoustic guitar and drums and sang the song, and that all sounded cool. And then I remember going, well, you know, I think I can play a bass to this and then put a bass on it. It's like, okay, that sounds good. And then I was like, I kind of hear a guitar, electric guitar part. So we did that, and it's like, and it had this real kind of raw, um, I, I, retro is not the right word, but it is a, but it had this, you know, old rock and roll feel to it. It sounded live, even yeah. though we were in the recording studio. It sounded like a live song, you know? Yeah. And it was just, it had a, a cool thing. And so I know, you know, that, gave Billy a spark, you know, cause he then was like, Hey, uh, you know, this, uh, this British invasion group, Chad and Jeremy. And I was like, I don't know who that is, but he said, well, okay, listen to this song. Yesterday's gone. And tell me if you don't think this is a hillbilly song done by, um, I don't British remember. Guys. <laughs> well, yeah, there was some term in front of British guys, but I can't remember what it was exactly, but you know, it's like, guys that shouldn't really be playing American hillbilly music. So we're like, he's like, well, let's, let's record this song. Let's do a cover of this song, but do it as, you know, as a more hillbilly leaning kind of song. And so we did that and it was like, okay, this is pretty dang cool. And it kind of just sparked everything, but that was the first song um, yesterday's gone that was recorded as the box masters essentially it became the first one the first song that was on the debut record and so we did that for a while we just kind of combined this british invasion hillbilly sound together and and then uh we only did that for a couple of records and and a lot of it was tongue-in-cheek kind of stuff you know right. and uh, we always tell people what if what would frank zappa do if he decided to do this and so uh but we ended up uh, just starting to sound like ourselves. And then we got other guys in the band and uh, we only did that sort of experimental thing for about two records. And then after that, mm -hmm. we just started sounding like the, you know, rock and roll guys that we are. And, uh, you know, each record, it's funny because each record is kind of went, it went from that sound to more Americana to then rock pop of the sixties to rock and to rock you know and so yeah, yeah. one thing that's you know places we play all the time you know because we got a really good cult following around the country and in other countries and and they know what we do and if you're playing at a place you've never played before sometimes they assume because on our first record or two which you can see videos of and things mm -hmm. like that they think that we're a, a country band and we're not at all and well, you're uh, Billy Bob, and I go by JD. Yeah, so it's like true. it's kind of you know like you, you could have better country band names. Yeah. yeah. 
So, so we we have to explain that to people in places where we haven't played before. You know, it's like sure. whether it's in interviews or I'll actually do it on stage. Sometimes, you know, after the first five songs, we blaze through five in a row, and you know, people are liking that old uh, uh, Max L or whatever commercial with the guy. <laughs> sitting back yeah, right. And uh, after right. the five songs, I will always say, "Well, I guess you can tell by now we are not a country band." You know, <laughs> but most places we play know us you know and and have but uh we got a few new ones on the tour this year well is that sound though that you you have that kind of country sound and like you said you evolved into this i guess that's the more real you but is there like on this new album do you ever venture out of that normal sound for you that you haven't done are there some newer sounds that you kind of venture into that haven't that you haven't done yet each album uh sounds slightly different you know i mean we, we've we've done i don't think we ever did two or three records in a row that had exactly the same sound on it uh we're always trying to progress and and do something a little different i mean you can listen to all those records and tell it's us but yeah. try to do different things and you know these days it's not a popular thing it used to be when I was growing up playing in bands, it's like everybody wanted to be different. Now the idea, uh, particularly in country music, like popular country music, you know, on the radio and everything, the right. idea is to be the same. It's like, we're going to write another song. It's going to be a hit because we're writing the same hit that was just out. So when they go into these writing sessions, they go in with, there with the intention of writing the same song only slightly altering it you know and it's like instead of it being about your truck it's about your your jeep i don't know whatever right. one way or the other it's the same right. same kind of deal and i think the same in pop music i mean people in pop music have developed the same voice it's almost like they go to a, a school yeah. to learn this yeah. voice. like here's how you sing this pop music and uh because you know i could listen to 12 artists and I, I, I it's like i don't know if that's mindy or muffy or timmy or bobby i i don't i couldn't tell you because it's that it's that very rehearsed sound of or created sound whatever it is that uh, and so we try to look we sound the way we sound but in terms of recording we can do different things we just finished a record that may be our favorite one of all time Next to, of course, Love and Hate and Desperate Places, which comes out <laughs> August 30th. But uh, well done. We, we just did this uh, record. Our studio is called Pepper Tree Hill. And uh, we wrote a record called Pepper Tree Hill. And we decided to go back some, uh, a couple of records back, and get more of that psychedelic 60s sound. And it, it sounds very different than uh, the other ones we did that were very 60s influenced. Uh, it's just got a... It, it's kind of it's it's what we were trying to do all along only refined you know and uh sometimes you do a record and you sit back and you go okay that's what we've been working toward right there that's what this is supposed to sound like just like love and hate we'd always want to do a record that was heavier that was <clears> not <throat> not as pop 60s as it was rock 60s and that's what love and hate is really more so when you accomplish those things, you can sit back and listen to it and go, okay, well, we did that. You know, we, we accomplished what we tried to do. And sometimes you have to be satisfied with that because when you throw it out to the public, they may love it and they may not love it. And it's out of your control at that point, but we're very satisfied with the records we've been making lately. And yeah, that's your ultimate goal though. Like when you're creating a new album and you're thinking about how the album's coming together, and you're thinking about uh, the sound. I mean, you know, like you're talking about Mindy and all these people that have the same voice. You know, in these days, everybody's looking for the hit or that song that's popular. But if if you have a love of music and your and your creative ideas are coming out, you're looking more to that, right? And if it happens to hit number one, hey, good for you, right? That's what you're going into it about, right? You you can't lose that way, right? You don't ever expect to have any success with any of it. I mean, <laughs> it's we don't make these records for success. We make them for ourselves and the 
satisfaction we feel when we record a song and we sit back and we go, we couldn't have played that any better, or we, mm -hmm. you know, we couldn't have done something else to it to make it any better. We've, we've thought about it. We played all the parts to the best of our abilities or even beyond our abilities. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the goal. You know, if, if, if our goal was to make hits, you know, we'd be playing a different kind of music. We'd be playing a different <laughs> kind of music. We'd have, we'd be hiring writers. We'd be hiring producers, but what joy would we get out of not playing our own music? You know, right. it's really, we would have other people playing it. You know, it, it wouldn't, well, we plus, wouldn't we be doing great, any of it. <laughs> plus, plus we have great, yeah. Cause you can make a song out of anybody. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. you know, Look, here's the thing. We're not AI guys. We're not uh, uh, guys who carry oh, stuff with us on the road. Oh, no. wait. Just wait till I oh, oh, figure, no, out, you're figure not, out how to do it. You're never <laughs> touching anything, I promise. But anyway, uh, one way or the other, uh, even like live, you know, we don't have tracks or anything like that. I mean, if we screw something up, you'll, you'll definitely hear it. And uh, so we're, you know, we're pretty organic and we just like to remain that way. And we have some great fans. I mean, when JD says we do it just for ourselves, we do it for ourselves, but meaning we do it for the people who understand us. And we have this cult fan base that really loves our music. We do it for them. And then if, like you said, if we get new fans from it, that's awesome. I mean, we, right. we want to reach as many people as we can. I mean, because the idea is to try to move people with your music and maybe even impart a little knowledge to people. If you can't do that, then why are you doing it? So I guess the best way to put it is we're not out. We're not out for hits and popularity. We're out to actually play the music that we play. That means something to us and hoping it means something to somebody else. And sure. uh, that's the audience that we really, the audience we have are those people who really want to hear this and uh and we hope for more fans all the time absolutely and like you said if we got <clears throat> if we had a number one song that'd be great you know we'd love that i mean who wouldn't uh right but we don't when we're writing a song we're not writing it for that purpose you know we're writing it because if, if you're not happy with it yourself if you're writing something that's not genuine to you then you're making a product at that point. You're making a pipe right. ring or a tube of toothpaste. Yeah. That's right. That's true. Uh, talking about writing a song, though, how do you come together on a song? Do you write the lyrics first? Do you come later with the guitar or whatever? And how do, how do you get together on the lyrics? Do you have these ideas floating around in your head? How does that work for y'all? It's different all the time. Just uh, whatever. So. It, it happens in different ways. I mean, it's been very rare that we just had lyrics first and then wrote a song. You, usually it starts with a melody and a few words, you know, that one or the other of us has. And, uh, you know, we uh, when JD's at his place, he lives across town from where I do and where the studio is. And uh, sometimes we'll get on, on uh, FaceTime and, you know, I'll show him, I'll have the guitar and show him a chord and say, hey, what do you think about this? A little pattern, or he'll show me something. And, uh, but it's very rare that we've had all the music first and then wrote words to it. Or the other way around, having all the words and then writing music to it. Uh, it's, it's usually a piece of something. It could be a melody for a verse, a melody for a chorus the hook lines you might say for a chorus or a couple of lines of a verse or a bridge it it, it just it happens differently but we've worked together on them so long that the second we hear one of the others say something about something the other one gets it you know and we weren't as good at it before but these days we're really good at listening down to a bunch of songs we've recorded and say, yeah, you know what? That, that I don't fit the album. We used to try to throw the kid think in there. And these days I think. Oh yeah. We'd put our records with 20, oh, 21 yeah. <laughs> songs on it because we had them all. And it's like, well, it, don't, it doesn't cost much more to make a CD with 20 songs on it versus 
to 10. Mm. So it's like, well, it's just right. all on there. You just have to print the lyrics really small. <laughs> right. Was that the discipline of, of as time goes by, you, like you said, you, you realize what does it belong to the album? Or maybe if the song, is there something within you when you're writing and you go, I like that. I like where this is going. Do you ever stop in the middle and go, mm, eh, I'm give up on this. Do you ever give up on a song? <laughs> no doubt. Go, yeah. I, I, you know, you know, the funniest thing that to look back on it, it's sometimes it might be a few lyrics, but a lot of times it's, it's titles. And I'll look back at stuff in my notes and I'll see these titles that, you know, late at night when I'd had a few, it sounded really good. <laughs> and then the next day you look at it and you're like, the hell was I thinking? And, uh, or I, I, I read a verse for a song the other day and it, it's like, and our, our stuff's pretty poetic, you know, and it, I mean, it really is. We're very thoughtful about being poetic and saying stuff in a, uh, the right way in songs and, and songs that actually rhyme. Yeah, exactly. Instead of rhyming, you know, like I used to say, the only guy that could do it was Roger Miller and he could rhyme love with claw hammer. But, uh, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, we try, you know, our, our songs are pretty heavy usually and, and mean something. And I looked at this thing in my notes the other day and I thought, what asshole wrote this? <laughs> it was like, I was like, what was I thinking? I mean, it looked like, you know, I, well, you you can't say it looks like a third grader did it anymore because third graders are really smart these days. That's right. <laughs> but uh, you know, it looked like somebody who had never written a song in their life wrote it. And, and, right. and God, I only got through about four or six lines, something like that. You know, but it was like I I must have been really depressed that night. <laughs> <laughs> Did you did you follow it up or did you put it to the side and use it as a reference of what not to write? You know, no, I just erased it. Yeah. <laughs> erased it. Hey, somebody stole my uh -oh. phone. Throw <laughs> the phone in the river. Um, right. but, you know, that's and I know songs are personal. Do you find that a lot of the songs that you write and you go back when you're singing on stage, you kind of remember what place you were at during writing that song? So it's got to be a big deal for the fans. But it's got to be a big deal for you if it's part of who you are, right? When you're singing a song and writing about it, right? For sure. There's no doubt about it. And we have songs that we still get a little emotional about on stage and we try not to show it. But uh, and uh, there are songs that the audience really responds to because it's kind of it's it, there's songs that are for everybody, you know, and uh, uh, and we you know we like to connect with the audience, too. We We like to sometimes you know after a you know a blast of five or six rock and roller songs in a row we'll we'll stop and you know let the room breathe and and maybe mm -hmm. tell a story about the next song so sometimes even if people haven't heard the song if they hear the story before they hear it live then all of a sudden you know they feel like a part of the song they know what it means and they know what it is and um uh, so those are the songs people sing along on and feel like, you know, because, you know, the ultimate goal is for to make the audience and the band one thing in there together, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I know you have a bunch of influences. I know there's a lot of songs you know, like the Beatles or, or groups like that, that really influenced you. You hear the songs and you're like, those are some great songs. Uh, is there a song that you think of as like the ideal song that maybe that you use as a a pattern or something to kind of measure your songs and go, that's a good song. I need to write like that. Is there a song like that that you go to? Yeah, I mean, there there are several. I mean, like, and not that this is a style of music we do, but just in terms of the songwriting. And I would say in, instead of particular songs, it's more like different artists. I mean, I would go to John Prine or Merle Haggard or Chris Christopherson, Warren Zevon, guys that really told stories in a clever way. Uh, and uh, and then in terms of the kind of music we play, I mean, 
if you think of the Beatles, you know, I go back to a day in the life or, uh, you know, songs like that, but we'll also go to, I want to hold your hand, which is a perfectly crafted pop song. I mean, really is. not every song has to be about some heavy subject. You can just be talking about your girlfriend, Susie, and it can still be a great song. I mean, I want to hold your hand. Was it got like eight lines and the whole song repeated or something like right. that? But it's right. uh, means something. I mean, <laughs> Nowhere Man, you know, uh, Nowhere Man is a great song by the Beatles that I go back to because it doesn't really have a chorus. It's kind of a verse and a bridge, a verse and a bridge, a verse and a bridge. Right. And so they didn't always follow songwriting rules. And I don't think you necessarily have to. I mean, I don't think it always has to be verse, chorus, verse, chorus, solo, verse, chorus, you know. And, yeah. and we write some songs that are kind of, we even write songs sometimes that we don't know why we have like an extra bar and something and it makes it harder to play the rest <laughs> of the stuff. And when yeah. I, I mean, when, when you're when I'll be out there trying to sing a song, I'm like, I'll come in the wrong place, and then JD will go, "Oh yeah, I forgot where that extra bar there." And I'm like, an extra bar, you know? And and, and yeah, there's all kind of stuff that we you know do, only because when we were doing it, it felt right to us, it just felt natural, yeah. so we did it. And uh, and also we like to kind of if anybody ever decides to cover any of our songs, you know, we kind of like to make them wonder what the hell's going on. <laughs> that's fun um well you know y'all record uh a lot of songs and a lot of albums in a short amount of time you know there's a lot of bands that are they'll put out an album you know every four or five years no big deal you're all, you're all putting them out there like hot cakes i mean why why do y'all want to put so much music out there as opposed to some people that just let them sit for a few years and you know and nothing yeah well, it's, it's just in us to, you know, if we have the songs, we're going to write them and record them. I mean, it's, there's no sense wasting time and we're not 25. So, you know, we want to get as much done as we can. And, and also, I think what you were talking to us about earlier, about how we're not in it for hits. A lot of these bands will work on a record forever because they're trying to get songs that will be hits and we write a certain kind of music and since we're not looking for hits we'll put out you know here's what it is we're album guys that's why mm -hmm. we, we we grew up on albums we still yeah. we still sequence our records like they used to uh, we try to tell a story with the whole album and so we've got a lot of stories so if you look at it in those terms we've done 17 songs instead of 17 albums <laughs> because we're, this is one piece of music to us. It's a, a we've a released music. 17. We've released 17. We've recorded more than <laughs> probably done That's twice, <laughs> but Hey, well, there's gotta be songs out there that are floating around that you haven't recorded. Are, are these songs on the, the new album? These were some of the songs that maybe you probably had sitting around maybe. And, and there's some new ones too, right? Yeah, totally. There there was uh, at least two songs that were from 2009. Mm -hmm. You know, they were just always just a little too heavy to be on some of the other records. And uh, the thematically. Well, yeah, but also sonically, they were just like, they're more of rock songs. Right. And so it, they just never kind of found a home and they you know they were sitting on another record that never got released so when we were coming up with hey well let's do this part of the reason was raymond was like hey you guys played this song back in 2009 2010 called jane mansfield's car i always loved that song you know why don't we play that song live and it was like well it's not on a record and but it's like well why don't we put it on a record and then we listen to the version that we had it's like well we wouldn't play it in that key these days you know so we bumped it up you know two or three steps it's like oh okay now it's coming alive you know we recorded it in that other key because that's where we wrote the the guitar id lick <laughs> sorry and mark collie would say um but uh but yeah, as we were kind of coming up with the idea that 
this would be the rock record. We were just looking at some of the other songs that we'd had. So Jane Mansfield's car and this song called I Never Dreamed I'd Lose just kind of fit with the stuff that we'd been writing for it. And uh, there were a few other things I think that we had, but for the most part, we wrote six or eight songs that were brand new. And the last one was kind of the last day of the recording of the record. It's like, I think I had to take a kid to a dentist appointment or something. And Billy and Kirk and Raymond um, were in the studio because Kirk had been playing all the lead guitar and Raymond had played bass. And, and we were having a great time just, you know, having our buddies hang out in the studio and play on these songs with us. And while I was at this appointment, Billy and Kirk and Raymond wrote probably my favorite song on the record called good night, sleep tight. I'm gone. And, uh, yeah, it, it was great. And so, you know, I remember the, you know, the last night of us recording, you know, Kirk's basically delirious and he has no idea what's going on. It's, you know, one o'clock in the morning and he's trying to play the lead guitar solo on that song. And the, the guys are, they're flying out in the next morning, you know, kind of early and, uh, like okay this is our last chance and he's like i don't know what i'm doing I, you know is any of this good and it's like dude this is great you know he, <laughs> right. he played you know some pretty amazing stuff because he can do it in his sleep but you know it was the last second and it's like here we go here we have the first i mean when jane mansfield's car came out as a single uh, a few weeks ago a river rising's kind of a, another preview track but then when the album comes out on the 30th Good night, sleep tight. I'm gone is like the real single. So, um, you know, it, it just happens that way. Sometimes it's like the last night of the, of the record. And there you are, you're coming up with a single and, uh, you know, it wasn't intended like that. And the record would have been really good without that song even existing, but we had it, you know, and it's great. And, uh, I'm super proud of, uh, you know, everything the guys did when they put it together and, and, uh, yeah, I just wish I would have been here when they were <laughs> creating it. So I could have been, so I could throw a weird chord in it just to, to mess it all up <laughs> or extra bar or something. Yeah. yeah uh, I, I do um, right before the verse. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, whenever you're recording and, uh, mixing everything, do you go back and listen, you know, do you listen to the whole album as a whole, like a fan would and, and sit there and try to get the whole experience and go, how would a fan take this in? And I know it's not like a concept album, but to me, every album is a concept album because you're taking it all in. Whatever's going on in your life, you're putting it in there and it's a bandage that's going on whatever you're, you're cut at or whatever emotion you're feeling. So do you sit there and go, kind of take it all in and soak it all in and go yeah so, so I gary like I, i'm gonna i'm gonna make sure see if this can can uh go with so we have a pair of these speakers up here on the wall they're uh tannoy Ooh. tannoy speakers um they get crushingly loud and uh they're glorious um <laughs> best best sounding main speakers i've ever heard and uh that is kind of the goal. It's like get them, get the songs done, get them all sequenced, and play them really loud on those speakers, and just sit back and listen to it, have it blow your hair back, and uh, you know it is like experience a concert, experiencing a concert because it's you know you get the volume, you get the the weight, you feel you know the heaviness of it, and. Uh, you know, it, it really is becomes a more kind of immersive experience where you really are feeling as well as listening to the music. And, you know, that's the goal. It's like, is it, is it really affecting you when you're sitting and listening to it? And, you know, is the sequence right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is are, Can you just sit there and close your eyes and just, you know, kind of feel it wash over you and are there any bumps in it? Is there anything that takes you out of the mood? And, you know, that's the the best way to, to kind of soak it all in. Is It's like if it goes from start to end and you, you know, you don't come out of the moment, then 
there you go. You succeeded. If something kind of catches you and you go, oh, what's that? You know, if, if some, it's like, okay, maybe we need to go look at that. Or maybe that song's in the wrong spot and we need to switch it with a different song and move them around a little bit so that the experience isn't messed up. You know, we, uh, you know, really make the records to feel good from beginning to end. It's not just going back to the hits. It's just right, like, right. Um, the, uh, the music industry and the, and the entertainment industry, you know, rough places, especially these days, I think, um, have there been times, and I know Billy Bob, you know, you've been in the acting side, but, uh, the music side is rough too. Have there been times where you're, you're, you're in a little mood and you're like, I, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And you have to talk yourself into it has there been a time where you just faced that wall and what made you change your mind or if you did not once i i can't live without it so i don't have problems as long as i'm creating i'm okay then <laughs> but uh my mental health yeah. issues kick in when I'm not creating. <laughs> you know, so, That's good. That's really good. I'm, yep. If I'm with my kids, I'm okay. You know, I'm with just with the family at home and my wife and stuff, just doing regular stuff. But uh, if I'm left to my own devices, you know, I don't, I don't do well if I'm not creating and even when I'm with them, I'm usually creating something. My my daughter is very creative, and uh, we work on stuff together with her projects and stuff. But I, I've got to be doing something creative all the time. My wife's good at creating drama. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same with mine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Keeps you busy. It keeps you busy, and you got to find oh, figure out what to do. Uh, that's <laughs> but yeah, they're creating uh, a pain in her. <laughs> Wait, no, it's a it's it's a it's a thing that it's a place that i have to go to you know every day i mean i mean if jd tells me oh i can be there this week at the studio monday and friday tuesday wednesday and thursday are pretty uh i have to uh you know really hang on to the ledge tight <laughs> try not to leave him alone <laughs> <laughs> i know uh, better than that and it's probably, it's probably why we both like to work every day on tour, too. It's like, yeah, you, know, you get out there on the bus and all of a sudden you start thinking about other things. It's like, I don't want to think about this. I want to think about that, you know. And so right. we like to keep working. So that's so the music. So the creative side of music is therapy. Hmm. Listening to the music is therapy. And I know the fans the same way. You know, I think these days music is, is helped many a person. Uh, not do something crazy. Let's just say that you know, and uh, help them get over whatever they're going through. And but it helps to relate. I think that's the biggest thing I, I love about it. You go ah, aha, you know, or you or you say something that means something to somebody, and they go, yeah, I can relate to what he's talking about. It's not just some guy writing some words. It's a processed cheese trying to make it, like you said, number one song. When a song means something to somebody, and when y'all are on stage and somebody's singing your songs word for word, that's got to mean a lot to you, right? Sure. I mean, we've gotten letters or comments in person or whatever about, hey, uh, this thing that you're saying with this song, you know, my, you know, my brother died too, and I, you know, I this meant, meant a lot to me. I listen to it every day. We've had people tell us that the song that gets them through the day is this one or that one, you know, and that means a lot to you. And and if you can affect even a handful of people that way, it's better than not doing it at all, you know. I mean, we're we're not, <clears throat> you know, we don't fill out uh, a SoFi Stadium, you know, but the audience is there uh that's who we play for and uh and and we're and we welcome all new ones but also you know it's it's especially if it's a place that we've never been and we see somebody who 
knows the songs and is singing the words, you know, and it's like, we've never been here, you know, it's not like these songs are getting played on the radio. You have to make an effort to go find them and listen to them. <laughs> so if somebody's there and has obviously put in the homework, I mean, we're almost like <coughs> we're taken aback. It's like, how did, how do they know who we are? We understand they're at the show, but how do they know the songs? And, uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, every time it, we're thrilled and it's like, it's, it's a special feeling that when you see somebody that knows the lyrics, um, you know, it's like, wow, it's, this is, you know, this is why we do this. You know, it, it's, this is why we take the show on the road, you know, cause I mean, we would be totally happy just making records all the time. Um, and not, you know, if we, not that we have to go on the road, but, you know, if we were, you know, had the luxury of only recording, you know, we'd be totally okay with that. Cause then, you know, we'd still have our creative juices, you know, flowing. But uh, when you go out and you see that these songs have touched somebody and that they're, you know, kind of living them right in front of your face, you know, it's, it's really a special thing. And it's like, okay. The, I mean, other than our own satisfaction, this is why we do this. Right. It's, it's good, um, you know, face to face who understand what you're doing. Right. Um, and uh, when you're recording an album, you know, do you set a goal as far as the overall? And I know, like you said before, back to that again about the success. You know, what is success? What do, what do y'all think? success is to you that it's different than other people but in what you're doing in the music and making albums and, and being on stage what is success to you well in terms of making records if we sit back and listen to it and we know we said what we wanted to say the way we wanted to say it and it sounds the way we wanted it to sound we feel it's a success already if we play a show and however many people are there go away happy or moved or changed or just entertained, then that's a success. So if that's 68 people or if it's 3,500 people or 75,000 people, it doesn't matter. Uh, if that audience is happy when they leave or, or feel satisfied, when they leave, then that's enough. You know, it's, uh, it's not about numbers. And we can't yeah. count that anyway. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, we're not math. It's, yeah, right. it's rough. I know it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what comes after eight? Um, well, you, you have 17 albums. I do know that. That's a good, um, uh, well, it's great to hear fans and things like that. Do you ever, you know, do you read like a review sometimes that might be critical? Do you ever pay attention to that? Or you just kind of go, ah, whatever. Do you, do, do, do you let that, you know, bother you any? If anybody goes, I don't like, I don't like what they're doing. Uh, you know, bother it's more than it does now. Yeah. Well, I, I, it, yeah. And it also, you know, um, also you could smell whether or not people were actually criticizing the music or criticizing us. Mm. you know um like maybe they didn't understand what we were doing and so you know they don't know how to say it in other words that they don't understand um Not but other words. times it would be more like a personal attack and yeah, yeah. you know and it's like we can you know that that is like you know what's the point of I don't know what the point of writing a review for it. Just don't even write about it. Well, you could, but, pay, or you just want to exactly get your own jollies by like, oh, I'm going to knock these guys down a peg or two. I always, like, I always thought critics should just be people who write about the stuff they like, because that's yeah. what I'm saying. In other words, why write about stuff you don't like? It's just like don't don't give it any any uh, play. You know, just forget it. You know, and uh, you know one of the things is you know like JD was saying, we never know. You never know what review is real anymore or not. See, you can have 
I mean, let's just say, you know, uh, there's a band called the doorknobs or something. And, you know, some guy's sister who lives in Torrance, you know, used to date the guy who plays bass of the doorknobs and she doesn't like him. So then her brother writes a review that says, this guy can't play bass and the son of a bitch may be able to play bass for anybody on the face of the earth. And right. it really always mean anything. In other words, they may like you or not like you. You may get a good review because somebody just likes you. Uh, and right. Maybe the record didn't strike them that well, but they want to help you out. Then you may get a horrible review uh, just because somebody doesn't like you personally, that they're jealous, they're whatever it is. So reviews, reviews meant more when there were fewer critics. You know, because coming up, you know, there weren't, you only had, you know, a certain number of critics. And now a critic is anybody with a, a phone. And so, you know, of course, there are people out there that li don't like people just based on nothing, just because they see you right. on uh, an interview and they don't like right. you. So then they'll say stuff like I today I could write a review about who's some singer that's just like ridiculous who could sing. Oh, let, let's just t take I mean, it's not like it's a band I ever listened to that much, but, you know, I know Steve Perry could really sing. Right. <laughs> right. And so I could write a really review. go staying current. You know? What's that? <laughs> I said you're you're really going current right now. Oh yeah. You know? Well, but I because I can't. <laughs> take I don't. I, I don't know anybody. So, but uh, so but I could write a review, a retrospective, <laughs> let's say, on Journey, and I could say, well, you know, some of the songs are okay, but Steve Perry just can't sing. I could say that in a review. Well, that's patently untrue, <laughs> you know. Right. But there are people who would listen to that. There are people who also maybe think, ah, Steve Perry looks like a smart ass. I don't like him. And then there would be this right. whole forum the next thing you know about how Steve Perry's really not a good singer. All this was made up and this wasn't true. No, the guy could sing and so kiss my ass. That's not true. I mean, so you get your reviews that you just don't know where it comes from. It comes from right. you did something they didn't like one time, you know, right, or something like that. And and then some right. people they say they don't like your music and they mean it. So, but you've got like all these different categories of reviews for different reasons. And so that's why I think it's easier to not pay attention to them these days. Whereas when there are only 25 critics on the face of the United States, <laughs> they, yeah, and if they didn't kind like of, it, you're like, like, oh, goodness. <laughs> you're, you're pretty screwed then, but uh, uh, that's and, right. you kind of had to listen to it. You know, you, you know, you had to kind of say, well, maybe we should stop writing, you know, songs about orange trees or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is good. Oh. Well, I will keep y'all, uh, you know, I don't want to be that, uh, I don't want to be long winded uh, or anything, but, uh, and I got it's, a little note. That's a podcast, so <laughs> we, we understand that, you know, we want to make it a but, good, uh, good thing for folks. So it's like, get to the end. We'll talk some shit about somebody. And <laughs> <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta have fun. Um, well, I just want to say this, y'all. Great job on the music. It don't matter what critics think, as long as, hey, if you're happy with it, and you know the people that you care about if your fans like it that's you know and there's going to be some new fans and i guarantee you that's coming up these are some really good what i've heard so far uh, i was impressed and i know but the album coming out on august the 30th right is that what you said right, just a couple of weeks uh love and hate in desperate places yeah um looking forward to that uh uh so I mean I know the fans are excited. I know I, I've been seeing y'all post uh, the music and everything, so I know that they're gearing up for that. And uh, I guess you'll be doing those songs at your concerts. What kind of shows have you got coming up uh, in the near future? You got a few of those, right? Uh, <laughs> a few of those songs on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're we're playing. Yeah, and yeah, you're doing those, yes, right? Yeah, we're doing four songs off the new record in the in the in this tour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, four songs. Okay, awesome. Oh yeah, 
This is what there it is. There, that's the album. Final of Love and Hate and Desperate Place. That's right. All that's art nice. Bella Thornton. Um, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't beat holding an actual vinyl record. It's, <laughs> it's, you yeah. know, it's like yeah, man, like especially if you're old, you can actually read all the the type. You can <laughs> even read the the little uh, marketed and distributed thing down at the bottom. Right. Oh yeah. All the cool. actually read those. Yeah. It's uh, you know, is there a is, is oh, there yeah. a picture of the band on the sleeve? No, on the yeah. inside sleeve. Oh, like the old they can see us. Yeah. Yeah. We, oh, they'll see. We used to put pictures of us in them, but not so much anymore. We we more like sort of abstract art stuff for their yeah. cover. You know, that uh, you know makes us feel what we're trying to feel here off of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's... And so it, I mean, because you know, you can get a million records with you know we're sitting in the studio and one guy's on a guitar with his headphones on, and you know. That was great in the 60s and 70s. We loved seeing it. Where you're leaning against a brick wall. And, or Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, in an alley. But, but we did. Look, you got to look tough, too. Yeah, you yeah. got to look tough. Everybody crosses their arms. Yeah. And lean like you're mad. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we used to do that. And so there's plenty of those that people want to see them. But these days, we just keep our old asses off the record covers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But, people can chart the weight gain over the years and that kind of thing. It's like, or the weight. And I'm sure they are keeping charts of it. Uh, well, I thank y'all for uh, for chatting with me today. It's all it's it's great to hear y'all uh, talking about it and a great conversation. Thank you for answering these questions. Y'all did it in a in a educational way for everybody uh, to get something out of it. You know, I mean, nobody was injured in the making of this uh, this podcast. And a uh, big fan of yours, Billy Bob, by the way. And uh, the Alamo, I love, by the way. Uh, <laughs> should have been a hit. <laughs> oh, Gary, that was yeah, appreciate awesome, it, buddy. Thanks, yeah, buddy. thank you all for, for everything. And uh, looking forward to hearing the rest of that music and uh, seeing you all out there somewhere. I, I guess you all be, I'm in Alabama. So maybe you all been, you all coming this way or? We're going to be in uh, Florence at the Florence. show Theater in Florence. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, man. All righty, y'all. Well, I appreciate y'all uh, talking to me today. Y'all have a great day, or whatever, what's left of it. Yeah, hey, and uh, yeah. thank you so much. We just begun today. So, oh, yeah. We're on rock and roll hours. So, this is morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll talk That's soon. True. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Bye. And there they are the Boxmasters, JD Andrew and Billy Bob Thornton. You know, I didn't even get the Billy Bob to do Carl Childers, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I missed that opportunity, uh, but a great band, very talented. Check them out near you. Go to their website for more information. Find out if they're playing nearby and uh, check out that new album called Love and Hate in Desperate Places. I think you're going to enjoy it. Coming out August the 30th. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Until next time, everybody, always remember to keep the music real.